Welcome to Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters. I'm Michonne Boston. And I'm Tequina Boston. We're your hosts and real life sisters who binge on historical drama. We'll talk about films, fictional adaptations, and dramatic series as windows to the past and mirrors of the present. So fill your teacup or mug with your favorite sip as we explore what's fact, what's fiction, and the so what on historical drama with the Boston Sisters. I'm Michonne Boston. And I'm Tequina Boston. Welcome to Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters, where we talk about historical films and dramatic series as windows to the past and mirrors of the present. Listen to past episodes and sign up for our newsletter on our webpage at michonnebostongroup.com backslash Boston Sisters to stay up to date on new episodes and bonus content. In this podcast, we talk about Killers of the Flower Moon with Dr. Maura Redcorn and her brother, Yancey Redcorn, of the Osage Nation. Yancey Redcorn appears in the Martin Scorsese film as Osage Chief Arthur Bonacastle, and Maura Redcorn was an extra in the film. Yancey and Maura's father, the late Charles H. Redcorn, authored the novel A Pipe for February, released by the University of Oklahoma Press over 10 years before David Grant's book, Killers of the Flower Moon. We'll talk with Maura and Yancey about the impact of the film, Killers of the Flower Moon, which received 10 Academy Award nominations, and Charles H. Redcorn's novel, A Pipe for February, in telling the history of the Osage and the reign of terror in the 1920s. Directed by Martin Scorsese, Killers of the Flower Moon is based on journalist David Grant's best-selling nonfiction book of the same title about the reign of terror, a grim chapter in American history. In 1920s Oklahoma, the discovery of oil on the Osage land makes the members of the Osage enormously wealthy overnight but their lives become a nightmare when Osage members mysteriously die one by one. Suspicion falls on a ruthless cattleman, William Hale, played by Robert De Niro, who is desperate to steal their wealth. The powerful and overbearing Hale enlists his nephew, Ernest Burkhardt, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, to pursue and marry Molly Kyle, played by Lily Gladstone. Molly is a fiercely independent Osage woman fighting for her family's survival. Hale convinces his nephew to carry out a plot to kill members of Molly's family and acquire the head rights to their wealth. The newly formed Federal Bureau of Investigation sends Tom White, an incorruptible former Texas Ranger played by Jesse Plemons, to Oklahoma to unmask the killer in a web of conspiracy. White embarks on a dangerous quest for justice against the backdrop of greed, betrayal, and the fight for survival. In addition to Gladstone, DiCaprio, De Niro, Plemons, and Yancey Redcorn, Killers of the Flower Moon's cast includes Tantu Cardinal, John Lithgow, and Brendan Fraser. Charles H. Redcorn's novel, A Pipe for February, follows John Gray Eagle an aspiring painter raised by his grandfather after the deaths of his parents in a car accident. In the book, the Osage murders in the Reign of Terror are described from the perspective of a traditional Osage. The University of Oklahoma states that the author draws on his own experiences and insights as a member of the Osage Nation. Killers of the Flower Moon author David Grand writes, A Pipe for February is an extraordinary novel evocative, riveting, moving. Charles Redcorn illuminates what the Osage people went through during the 1920s when oil profits had made them fabulously wealthy and when they began to die under mysterious circumstances systematically targeted for their money. This novel, exquisitely written and filled with revelations, will hold you in its grip and never let you go. 
The film Killers of the Flower Moon is currently streaming on Apple TV with a subscription and available for downloads and streaming for a fee. The books A Pipe for February by Charles H. Redcorn and Killers of the Flower Moon by David Grant are available in our podcast affiliate bookstore. Go to our website at michonbostongroup.com backslash Boston Sisters and click on the bookstore link to purchase your copies and support this podcast. We now introduce our guests, Dr. Maura Redcorn and Yancey Redcorn. Maura Redcorn and Yancey Redcorn are the son and daughter of the late Charles H. Redcorn, author of A Pipe for February, and artist Geraldine C. Redcorn, who was inducted in the National Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2022. Dr. Maura Redcorn is a staff psychiatrist at the Oklahoma City Indian Clinic and an artist with a degree in visual studies from Dartmouth College and a medical degree from the Oklahoma State University Center for Health Sciences. Maura's art mediums include painting, printmaking, and multiple self-taught mediums, including sewing, leatherwork, woodworking, beadwork, and silversmithing. She's a former member of the national women's rugby team, the Eagles. After retirement from rugby, Maura played roller derby with the Oklahoma Victory Dolls. She lives in the Osage with husband Bill Nunez, Cat Hazel, and Mastiff Pumpkin. Yancey Redcorn portrays Chief Arthur Bonacastle, Chief of the Osage Nation during the 1920s, in the film Killers of the Flower Moon. Yancey Redcorn is a name giver in his Osage Peacemaker clan, a right passed down by his father, who received the right from Wakanaran, whose other name is George Redcorn. George Redcorn was the younger brother of Yancey's great-grandfather, Raymond Redcorn Sr. Raymond Redcorn was murdered by poisoning during the Reign of Terror. Yancey Redcorn also appears as Preacher Paul in the final season of the FX series Reservation Dogs, produced by Taika Waititi and directed by Sterling Harjo. Yancey Redcorn was a member of the University of Oklahoma rugby team in his undergraduate days and achieved a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science from the University of Oklahoma. He later continued his studies, specializing in federal Indian law at the University of Oklahoma College of Law. Yancey, Mora, their mother Geraldine C. Redcorn, and Yancey's son, screenwriter Miles Thorpe Redcorn, are working together on the adaptation of Charles H. Redcorn's novel, A Pipe for February, for audio, stage, film, and television. Welcome, Yancey and Maura, to Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. It's great to be here. Well, to my pleasant surprise, while watching Killers of the Flower Moon, I saw elements of your father's book, a pipe for February, starting with the opening scenes and the ceremony with the burial of the sacred pipe. It's a mournful scene, rep- I, I'm, I'm assuming, representing the loss of Osage traditions with a younger generation who's embracing modern Western ways of living and values. And in another scene, we also see a painter in the background. Um, I'm assuming that's John from the book, from the novel. He, John is the main character in A Pipe for February. Talk about your father's book of Osage life and culture and how, they, how it's depicted in Killers of the Flower Moon. And what were your thoughts seeing part of A Pipe for February come to life in this film? I'm going to let Moore answer that because she was actually in the scene of the opening oh. scene. She was, oh, she was, yes. she, now she was the mourner. <laughs> And so she was a mourner in that scene, and you could see her in the background crying, mourning, mourning as they say when they were burying the pipe. So she's she's got a lot of information as far as that with the killers and dad's book. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't actually initially cast for that. I was actually um, ca- basically a, an extra. You know, I just kind of showed up, and that's the one day Yancey and I were on set together. And, um, we had gotten together and 
met casually when I wasn't, I mean, I met her casually, but Yancey officially met um, Marianne Bauer, who uh, we became pretty close, you know, over the past few years, really. Um, and I had asked Marianne, I, you know, just, hey, what would you think if I could at least be present on that day when they film that scene? Because um, it, 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 they actually bought the rights from us to do that scene with the idea that they're going to do the scene. They did, they pulled a few other things out from dad's book as well. But I, so I asked and anyway, eventually kind of after a, a few back and forths or whatever, um, they agreed to have, have me in it. They also actually wanted mom in that scene as well. And it was going to be pretty cool. Um, but it was also, ridiculously hot <laughs> so uh uh oklahoma in the summer is no joke and and it was out on the prairie and every, you know you're intense you know there's a couple of um trailers out there which you know you assume is you know martin scorsese and and uh, you know leo um but on that day you know there wasn't going to be kind of the comfort of any kind of air conditioning. So, so mom kind of ended up backing out on it. Um, thought it might be a little too much for, her. um, I think she just turned 84. Is that right? Yancy? Yes. Yeah. And so, but that day was, uh, it was very special. Um, we, we filmed it, a we filmed it a couple of times. We, that first day was out on the prairie and I remember, I mean, it was just magical to see what dad wrote come to life. I mean, like it was amazing. So the crying actually wasn't that big of a jump for me. You know, I had been in a one play before, uh, but not, you know, I'm not like Yancey's, you know, degree of acting, but I, you know, had been in a, a couple of things or whatever. And, uh, I remember after that first scene, I was just, I mean, after our first take, I was bawling. It was so moving. Um, and of course you do several more takes and, and after at the, when we, we had a little break and went through and I went over to Marianne and I said, Oh my gosh, you know, I said, I, you know, I, I cried that in that first scene, but I know that, you know, the, the speaker that was in front of us, he, the, the guy doing the, the lines at the time, who was actually Larry Sellers was actually cast for that initially. But he, when, when we came back later the next year, um, he had passed away. And mm -hmm. so Tali, um, our first cousin, um, got stepped in and, and did the part cause they wanted to reshoot that scene. I mean, like a year later, they came back in and shot a few scenes. Um, and so, uh, so I remember that first I, I, I cried. It was, it was just bawling. And, um, and I said to Marianne, I said, I said, Oh my gosh, I, I cried that first. And I, I cried during that first uh, take because all I had done was theater before. And I said, I didn't, couldn't cry afterwards. And she said, well, that's why it's called acting. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Oh yeah. Okay. never mind. <laughs> Um, but it was, a, it, it was moving and we had, and you know, everybody in there was just, we were all bawling really through much, through much of it. Um, so that was a, 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 a beautiful, a beautiful moment. Um, that's how I felt seeing dad's, dad's, uh, book come to life. Well, and, 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 and to your point too, uh, when you asked, you know, elements of my dad's book. Well, you know, in that opening scene, you know, the, the burial of the sacred pipe, uh, uh, which, you know, it does represent the Osage's more than the loss of traditions with the younger generation that's going to be embracing modern Western ways of living and values. But that stuff came directly from my dad's great, great uncle who took over after, after uh, our, his grandfather, my great grandfather, Raymond Sr., was murdered. So Wake and Iron or George Redcorn took over and he was born in 1881, I think. And, uh, he, he learned all those traditions 
that my dad talks about, those old, older men, that's what my dad heard from him on what had happened at the turn of the century. And, you know, what, what was, what had, what had happened with the burial and, and, and how, uh, those people were, those elders were putting away the old ways because in order to survive, they had to embrace, you know, what the modern world that was coming up. So, uh, that was not, uh, uh, more and I, are, and my dad were really, are, and my mom are really good friends with David Grant and my dad passed away, but he wrote a great book. But my dad's book uh, really helped Killers of the Flower Moon have uh, a color to it. Like, uh, for example, uh, my character Chief Bonnie Castle wasn't mentioned in uh, wasn't mentioned in uh, Kill- in Killers of the Flower Moon book. It was mentioned in my dad's book. So I think they had a character that was the chief. But then, when after they read my dad's book, they just put Chief Bonnie Castle on there because they, I, I think they, well, if they read the history of Chief Bonnie Castle, then uh, it was a good move on their part. And so uh, that's you know a, a, it it brought it brought color to it, and uh, you know it, just like uh, uh, a lot of people in our family, including my sister, uh, are artists. And the Red Corns have a lot of artists in our in our thing. My dad was an artist, and his brother Jim was an artist. So in the book, you know, they you know they used to paint stuff about Osage ways of life back, you know, pre pre colonialism, but also you know, uh, at the at the turn of the century, they they and I, as well as modern photos of of Os- I mean mo- modern paintings of Osages, but but he he brought that in as John Gray Eagle, because he was a painter. So if you, I mean, I think one of you've read the book, he really gets into looking at all the different people that's in that book and looking at the scenery and everything that my dad grew up around that place on how it would make a great painting or how this person would make a big, great painting with a portrait of. So he really brought that in and you could really feel it. I mean, like the Bonbon, the Bonbon Cafe was written in my dad's book. It wouldn't have been in David Grant's book, and it wouldn't have been in the movie if they hadn't used my dad's book. There's all there's just all sorts of color through the book that I mean, through the movie that's from my dad's book, uh, especially the Osage's way of life and their culture that's in the film. So that's a you know, I mean, we the first time I saw it, I noticed it right away. I was like, wow. You know, especially the open scene is ver- the opening scene is verbatim from my dad's book, and then, and then uh, there's other p- scenes in in there that I'm like, wow, that's right out of my dad's book. Wow, that's right out of my dad's book. Oh, wow, you know. So that was just catching that. I need to watch the movie again. I've seen it like three or four times. I need to watch it just to watch it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, but I did notice a lot. A lot of my dad's book is in in the Killers of the Flower Moon. That was very exciting for me to see because I read your dad's book. I read David Grant's book before seeing the movie. And when that opening scene, I was like, oh, my God, it's the novel. Right. right. It was very exciting to see, I have to say. Let let me tell you a really quick, not funny story, but I had the rights to uh, I have the rights to my dad's book, audio and everything for it. Which I share with my sister and, and my mom. I I probably started in 2010, 2009, talking to different production companies and even big ones. And everybody that I talked to, uh, there was a script that my my dad had written and uh, and uh, and my mom had helped him out with the script. But every time they I talked to him, they were going, well, we could think about doing it, but you've got to get rid of that opening scene. You've got to have something like with you've got to have something with murder. Somebody's got to get murdered right at the beginning, all that. And I was like, man, that's kind of like the best part of the book. Hello, right there. <laughs> and it t- it took you know ten more years later for a genius like uh, Martin Scorsese to read it and go, wow, we've got to put that in as the opening scene in the in the in the movie. So 
I just didn't have enough uh, power. <laughs> <laughs> so, everything in its time. Everything right. in its time. So, but that's, I mean, it, it's, uh, I've been very happy with how it came out. And, and I mean, Marty is a, is a genius. I mean, he's a, he's a true genius and he, he went pre-production and really embraced the Osages and, and listened. He didn't ever, he didn't ever interrupt the elders when they talked to him and told them their, their view of what he should be doing. He listened to all of them and tried to stay true to the Osages. Wow. Well, in looking at the Osage culture and traditions, and I did go to the Osage Foundation website as well, uh, where they were talking about um, how the foundation is looking at the Osage in terms of people present today who have a culture that um, you are transmitting to uh, younger generations. So, How are the culture and traditions of the Osage being transmitted to younger people? And uh, what's been the impact of technology uh, on the culture in terms of that cultural transmission? I was thinking about when you ask this question, it, it, it makes me think of just the, um, flow of what it's like. I actually live in Osage County. Yancey lives in Oklahoma. Um, but I'm uh, like where I'm living now is in Osage County and there's sort of an ebb and flow of, um, when you ask about transition, trans, um, transmitting culture, there we go. Transmitting, transmitting culture. Um, it's alive in that you know, we have this, you know, we have a way we bury people. We have a way, you know, uh, weddings happen. We have a way that we celebrate things. Um, there's a game and, uh, that we play, uh, it's called hand game. Um, and a, a many, many tribes play and, and eat and the tribes each have kind of their own little ways to play it, but it's, you know, you can use it as maybe a fundraiser. You can use it as a celebration. When I graduated medical school, I had a hand game to celebrate, you know, and, uh, just to kind of come back to the community and people come and play. And, and a friend of mine noticed, uh, when, uh, she was visiting Osage County and, you know, we, ha- there was a hand game. She, one of the things she noticed is like, oh you're having this celebration and the entire community is participating. The elders come, the little kids come, you have little kids like safely running around the whole community building. Um, and everybody can play. I remember playing when I was very, very little. What were we Yancey? Like maybe two and four, maybe when we lived in, when we lived at um, next door to the Osage Baptist church. Yeah. um, I remember playing barely being able to sit up and um, I was playing and I beat Hazel Harper, who was an (laughs) old lady who was like playing and she, and, and I beat her. I tricked her. It's a, it, you hold um, beads in your hand in one of them. And you basically just, You know, you just have to guess which beat it's in. But there's drums, and it's just a blast. I mean, if you have a chance, you should look up just hand games in general because it's so fun. And everybody laughs, and it's just kind of goofy. It can be goofy. It can be very serious, too. There's people who play it in a really serious manner. Um, The Red Corn family does not play it in a serious manner. It's super fun. But I remember when I was that age and beat her. Uh, in that and just it just sticks with me like oh this is how you do things another another thing that that <laughs> that is kind of thinking about this question this morning about passing on culture um you know when when there's there's and i suppose everybody used to do this um when you invite somebody to participate in something or another um there was a time when you would go to their house and you would sit down, you know, and you'd have some coffee and you would 
ask you know, them to do whatever it is. And you see that a lot in dad's book, right? Like I'm going to ask them, right? There was even this scene, right? Where, where John had, I think it was, was it Yancy Yancey and I just read this the other day because uh, we're doing the recording for it, but I think it was John had to ask Molly to go to somebody like Aunt Mary's house or something like that. And he asked her like kind of just in passing and then it, and then he and then Molly said, "We are gonna come to my house and ask me, right?" Meaning that's what you do. That's how you ask people. And you know, my dad, our dad did that uh, when he would invite or when he did things. He would he, there might be an actual invitation, but he would carry it to your house and he would hand it to you and he would talk to you. And I grew. <laughs> I didn't realize that people don't do that. You know, and so as when you say, how did technology affect that? Well, the postal service, right? Let's start there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right? yeah. Oh, yeah. Like just <laughs> over time, these things shift and change. Uh, the telephone. Now you can pick up a phone. You can invite somebody. Now, uh, you know, the invitations are different. Um, you know, I am currently um, having a little break from social media because I was stressing myself out. But, um, but I, uh, I miss a lot of invitations now because of that, mm. right? Mm. Just like, uh, you know, we had an elder die last week and I didn't know until way after, you know, because I'm not on social media and the communication manner is so different. Um, yeah. So that's what I, I mean, does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Well, we also have uh, our language program. The tribe gives $1 million a year. And you can take classes online, whether you're in California or whether, wherever you live. And, and you, you have these, you know, different levels of, uh, you know, beginning, then it's, you know, intermediate and going that stuff. So you can take these classes and they have them every year and like on, in semesters and you, they got a workbook and I think it's a workbook. Well, and- that, no, it's ongoing to, to, I've, I've been taking, I'm in my fifth year of classes. Um, I've not been a good student this year, <laughs> uh, but I, but I, up until this year, I had been pretty uh, diligent about studying. Um, but yes, that, it, it, but you're right, Yancy, that does affect the technology and COVID, right? Affected that because previously they didn't offer online classes, even though it was available, you had to come in person. So I started when I first moved here, um, going to classes and that wasn't, uh, that they didn't, they wouldn't even offer it. And so that COVID actually shifted that. And so now we have a lot more students. Yeah. So there are pluses and minuses that the technology either, you know, takes something away or shifts how it happens or enables some things that, it, you know, weren't possible before. Yeah. Yes. I wanted to ask, I piggyback on that question with this question, because it sounds like uh, what's called dual identity. And especially when we talk about A Pipe for February, how your father has characters who are coming into then the 1920s. There's a character who's, puts his, there are two guys who are going to the Olympic Games. There's John the painter. I think Molly talks about going to college or or school advanced studies. And um, what, what do you think um, a pipe, what does a pipe for February tell us in terms of the story through these characters and dual identity in the Osage community? Because we, we were talking about technology and bringing traditions into technology. So it's sort of a, like a hybrid, as yeah. it uh, and understanding culture is never static. So it would be normal that any culture you go through changes. And yet at the same time, how do you um, retain what is good from your, your ancestry and your cultures and your traditions at the same time the adapting to a world that's constantly really? changing and encounters with people who are different and don't know those traditions, don't know those customs? I, I, I just uh, right just right off the top of my head, I'm thinking of John Gregel, who's about 24 years old, and you know, in 1924, 
You know, he's an artist, he's educated, and he's traveled Europe. You know, he traveled Europe studying art, and, you know, he returned to Pahuska from the trip. And then when he arrives, he finds out, you know, there's Osages being murdered. But my dad didn't focus on the murders in the book at the forefront. He focused on the young Osages that were in their early 20s that, you know, were incredibly wealthy and they could afford anything they wanted. Uh, they had, you know, chauffeurs, chefs, landscapers, horse trainers for their stable of racehorses. And uh, obviously the whites resented them because of this because they said, you know, they, that they didn't deserve all that money. But even though like John Gregel is wealthy and he can live in the modern world, you know, he, st he still took time to listen to his elders and he tried to live in two worlds. And it's kind of like Osages still do this today. I know I do it and I, I know Moore does it. And, you know, you have to jump back and forth. There's even a way of, you know, teasing other Osages. We have different slang. And it's, uh, you know, like when I get back up there on the res, you know, the, it's, it's, it's a different way of talking to my, uh, my peers and to my nieces and nephews. And we do a lot of teasing and stuff like that. But, you know, back in modern times, I mean, in, in the modern world, you know, it's, it's, you know, you're working and you're serious and, you know, it, it, so you, it, when I, I live away from it, so I'm not interacting with it on a daily basis, which is I, I should, and I wish I could. And I think that's one of my goals is to be up there, you know, all, uh, all the time. So I can attend all of the different functions they have. They always have a function every weekend somewhere that's going on. And, uh, I always regret not being there, but, uh, but, but with, with, with John Gregel and his, and his, and his cousins, uh, they, they, even though they were wealthy and could afford anything they wanted to, they still embraced the culture and the culture is what got them through the reign of terror. And, uh, and that's what my dad was trying to say. They embraced, they, they embraced it. They held on to it, and uh, it it, it kind of kept them moving forward, even though they were losing a lot of what was traditional in the 1800s. I think, Aquina, you, you really bring up such a good point about that shift and change that we all go through, too, right? Like, you know, frankly, not all traditions are good, right? Because That's in true. the United States... There was slavery, right? And that was that was a tradition that we lived in, or we didn't live in, thankfully, but was going on in our world. But that tradition wasn't helpful. Tradition, you know, I went to an all male school, which was only like maybe twelve years out of becoming co-ed, and the numbers of males to females. I mean, it was, it, it, it was, um, hard, you know, and, and that, um, and they have, they had traditions at Dartmouth that, you know, um, uh, uh, there was an Indian symbol, which was a tradition. And I'll tell you, man, in the eighties, um, and the, the alumni did not want to let that go, uh, as a tradition. Right. So traditions are hard to shift and change. And mm -hmm. and that's what we're you know, that is what we do. That is what the, you know, burying the pipe does, too. Right. It, um, you're burying you're burying traditions that maybe aren't working for you anymore. Mm -hmm. And it we don't we really don't know. I don't know what those were, you know, what got buried. You know, we you can read books and you can kind of glean what it was. But. I want to trust that they are burying those things um, for a reason. Yeah. And, you know, you can exercise values in many different ways. It may not be that the way, I mean, we live in a city that only just, what was it, two years ago changed its mascot? And what, we're in the 21st century. Um, but. There's something about even uh, as you were describing 
Maura and Yancey, how your father's book in telling those stories is transmitting a sense of belonging to something larger than just our own time, you know, belonging to a larger people and place and, and history. Um, and even storytelling is kind of a tradition that we pass on from generation to generation, though the stories may be different. <laughs> And, and I, I love I, agree. I love in the book how the traditions start to have an impact on John's art and what he's told yes. as well. Yes. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. I have a question about history. Um, Yancey, you portray Osage Chief Arthur Bonacastle, who is a real person um, in Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, tell us his story and how you interpreted Chief Bonacastle's story for this film. Uh, well, I was lucky that I was familiar with them because uh, my dad had told me about him, and then he, obviously he wrote him. Uh, he he mentioned him in his book, but he uh, he was born probably in the eighteen eighties, along same time as my uh, great grandfather and my great uncle Wakenard. And so uh, around the turn of the century, he was in boarding school in Carlisle in Pennsylvania. And uh, around 1900, 1901, he left boarding school to join the U.S. Army. So that it probably shows how bad boarding school was for him to, to, to just leave and join the U.S. Army. So he joins the U.S. Army and he gets... Uh, uh, eventually gets shipped overseas, and he fights in the Boxer Rebellion. And he was the first person to climb over the, the Great Wall and engage in combat, hand-to-hand -hand combat. So uh, we regarded, people of Osage that knew him regard him, you know, as, as, a, as a great warrior. And, you know, he, he was also a world traveler. And so he came back, he was a translator, and he he embraced the peyote religion and said so the peyote religion came to the osages from caddo jake a caddo tribal member he he was the first one to start the peyote religion and he brought it to the osages probably around 1904 1905 and and uh bonnie castle started uh embracing that and doing peyote meetings and he grew his hair out and into braids and then he ran for council and uh probably 1906, 1907, and he got a, gone on as a Osage Council member. And uh, and again, he was a translator, so he translated probably between the federal government and the Osages and, and agreements and things like that. And, and to where he eventually uh, became the chief of the Osages and uh, in, the, in the early 1920s. And so I brought to my character, because there was, there was some lines at first in the script where he talked like he was kind of resigned to what was going on with the murders when he was talking to Tom White and in the script and I and I told I told Marty I said man I don't I don't I don't think he would talk like this and he goes well write what you think he would say in that scene so I typed it up and uh emailed it to him and 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 he he read it and he he said man that's good so go ahead with that so so I did, and 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 in the in the movie, you know, because I, 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 I knew since he was a translator, he could speak English well, and I also knew uh, everything that he's been through. He was he was a warrior. He wasn't afraid of anything. He's proved to himself. You know, he can go to hand to hand combat. He can, you know, he he was worldly, so he'd seen a lot, and and that you know, the wool couldn't be pulled over his eyes on stuff. And, and so I, I also knew that he wasn't going to be somebody that was, uh, braggadocious or loud or, or, or anything like that because he didn't need to be, I mean, if he wanted to, he could bring it if he needed to. But, uh, I, I knew he was, since he was a translator, he was a good mediator. So, I mean, I, I put that into what I did and, and, and like in one of the, and uh, in, in one of the things that they kept in an ad, ad lib is, uh, I mean, I got to use it. I said, uh, when it stayed in the movie, I go, in the old days, we would fight these people. 20 years ago, when I was at the Boxer Rebellion, I was one of the first people that climbed over that Great Wall. I could see my enemy, and I knew who I could kill. 
but I can't see this enemy. If we could see this enemy, then we would fight these people and we would kill them. And that was just the kill them was in the script. I just added that because all all the background guys that were behind me, probably 95 percent of them were my relatives and they were Osage. So mm. every time I it, it didn't come off much in the movie, but when we were doing the scenes and I was going through my lines, every time I'd kind of finish a phrase, they would they would all say at the same time like "hoy, ha, ha." I mean, it was it was really I didn't know they were going to be doing that when I did when I went, did in the scene. So it came off. It, it, so that's why you know it kind of started firing me up each time we do the take, you know, from different stuff like that. And so eventually, you know, I just went, you know. Uh, you know, if we'd find these people, we would fight them and kill them. And that, that stayed in. And, you know, they all behind me went, whoa, you know, like that. And it was Jesse Plemons. That was the first time he he was in the scene. And he 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 uh, afterwards, I go, I go, what do you think? Because it was just him facing out all of us. And, you know, and I'm talking to him as a chief and and they're just, you know, they, they, a lot of the Osages put in there are big boys. I mean, you know, six four, six five, and they're, you know, they're not small. And I go, I go, that must have looked pretty intimidating. And he goes, Yeah, I thought they were going to jump over you and and attack me. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, just uh, uh, that's Chief Bonnie Castle, and and how I I looked at him and how I used it in my in my uh, role as him. Yeah, kind of like as a mediator and calm, but but you know still able to you know state his point. That sounds like we need a film just about the chief too. He's an yeah, that's a good idea. I've thought thought about that. Yeah, you've been enjoying historical drama with the Boston Sisters, a podcast where we talk about historical drama series and films as windows to the past and mirrors of the present. Visit our webpage at michonbostongroup.com backslash Boston Sisters. Share this podcast. Join our historical drama community by signing up for our newsletter to stay up to date on future episodes and bonus content. Now, back to our podcast conversation. Well, I'm going to stay on this topic of history because Killers of the Flower Moon was a topic of discussion when the Oklahoma State Legislature passed Bill 1775 in 2021. And Tequina and I read a story on the KOSU NPR station website about a teacher who was afraid of losing her school's accreditation and her teaching license um, because teaching this book, this story, and the history could violate the HB or House um, Law 1775. What's in this bill, and what does it mean for teaching the history of the Osage and others left out of textbooks for so long? Well, it, it's uh, you know it was passed in 2021, and it, it says that you know the state of Oklahoma it bans teaching certain concepts around race and gender and it, and it it's it's to ban critical race theory but it also in there uh, it's it's there and I, I i haven't i mean i've read the bill when it first came out but it it says that you can't teach anything that's going to make somebody else feel less than or or feel like they've uh, 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 feel like uh, feel bad about what their ancestors did and so it's basically to to knock out anything that's going to hurt, as, as as I'm saying, as, as white people's feelings. So, uh, and they're doing that all over the United States, but Oklahoma is particularly doing it. And so that we've they've got a a a Secretary of Education Ryan Walters that he's really going overboard and. Uh, trying to uh, actually he's just trying to scare the teachers to where they won't do anything they will lose their job to lose their pension they'll do anything like that and that's in the, the interesting part of that person you're talking about that did could couldn't teach decided not to teach killers of the flower man at her high school it's in a it's in a um, it's in a town called Nowada, which is just it's not too far from pahuska it's just right outside osage county and uh 
it's uh you know it's it's right there by the Osages, and she was afraid to to teach it for fear of losing her teaching license and and uh, you know and so she didn't. So that's happening a lot in the in the state of Oklahoma, and uh, I mean here it is we we've got a book and they even got a children's book now that was that's written the Killers of the Flower Moon children's book, and uh, teachers are afraid to teach our own history, and that includes you know the Tulsa race massacre in 1921 when the you know which was going on at the same time as the Osages were being killed, uh, and so you know they don't want anything to be you know, discussed about that. Now that it's, no one really knew about it, uh, the Tulsa race massacre, where they, you know, they bombed Black Wall Street and uh, basically decimated that place and killed, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, of people at that time in like one night. And, uh, and so they don't want to talk about that either, which they hadn't talked about for a hundred years or, you know, Close yeah. to 100 years to where they've started recently, people started reading books and going, oh, I didn't know that happened. I didn't know that happened. So they're not even letting that thing be taught in uh, in schools, too. It's, you know, things that happen in our backyard. Well, it was even Finally, taught as, I mean, it wasn't, when we were growing up, it wasn't taught as a massacre. It was taught as a riot. Mm-hmm, and yeah. it, and in Oklahoma, right. it was taught um and I was talking to my husband about this and he was saying, oh, yeah, I, he goes, I remember that. He goes that we were taught that it was a riot by the black community that lived there and they burned their they bur- they burned it down is the way it was taught when when we were growing up, you know, and then and that it was um, over um, somebody being um, inappropriately. Um, convicted of a crime. I think. I think that's what he said. I. I. I I'm not. It sorry. was. It was. It was. What? Yeah. What? What? Yeah. That's what they've said. But what really happened was some, some, uh, uh, a black younger kid accidentally bumped into a lady that was white, and it. It. She said she was attacked, and I think that then. Then that just got everybody all in a hussy, and you know they got the picket forks and started going. It just, it, they just needed an excuse. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the newspapers weren't helpful in that case either. Um, no. If, if you <laughs> study the history. Yeah. Not at all. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Um, we're talking about people who are afraid of learning real history because they think it might make someone uncomfortable or be harmful. And I've been, uh, with a group that uses um, a method called narrative medicine, where actually they use story as kind of a healing modality. So, um, and more, I'm particularly interested in that you have, a, a, you know, you practice psychiatry. How does bringing attention to this history actually uh, possibly contribute to healing uh, Osage? people and, um, you know, potentially uh, helping heal some of the other kinds of, of wounds that have, are, have come out of some of the difficult historical times we've lived through? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I thought about this um, in thinking through this healing concept. Um, I think to me, the way I work with my patients and with, you know, people I come in contact in, in, in whatever situation, but the way I work is I feel like I first have to define, you know, what is a meaningful life? Because that's where I'm, that's my trajectory. I'm trying to get to what does a meaningful life look like to you? So how do we heal these um, valleys and, you know, just these uh, chasms of, of breakage and, and, and trauma and generational trauma? How do we, when we're talking about healing, I, I, I guess, I mean, I'd be very interested to hear, I'll, re, I'll read about that narrative medicine um, 
you know, because because yeah, storytelling and what you guys are doing and creating in this platform allows for people to talk. But I think one of the challenges I'm kind of thinking as I think through this particular question is thinking, bringing this story to light allows people that are outside of us who know the story and grew up with the story to some degree and are, you know, daily, I feel like learning more and more and more. Um, But that's their journey of healing. And I, in my personal spiritual and emotional journey am not trying necessarily to change their mind because that doesn't really, I'm, that's not going to help. I mean, it could help me. Like, I, you know, doesn't mean I'm not going to vote. Doesn't mean I'm not going to like have co- a conversation with people about things, but my personal healing emotionally, I can tell my story and hopefully here. So I think that's, is that maybe the part of narrative medicine? I'm not sure because I'm not familiar with that. But I wonder, is that the part of narrative medicine that helps me being able, like us having this conversation, hearing, learning about you, you know, learning more about your journey, and then you learning more about me creates connection and healing, I, I think. Yeah. And even, I think, being able uh, to talk about difficult things in a society that wants to shut that down. Yeah. It's an act yeah. of courage yes. and therefore an act of healing because now you're no longer just carrying this as something inside of you. Okay. I see what you're saying. You can kind of release it and then other people go, oh, wow, you know, something like that happened to me too. Or people just, even just being able to share Gosh. and have people just receive it, not yeah. try to convince you that somehow you need to be fixed or yeah. you, uh, it, it was all your fault or whatever. It's like, no, this actually happened. Right. And, and you know, you bring, you, uh, Yancey and I uh, have a, a really interesting story, I think, that happened to us when we were at Cannes, um, which... Yancey got invited to, and I like paid for and tagged along. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, that. I, don't, I'm not I, know that. I know that <laughs> I'm not missing this situation. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so we were, so, so luckily I got to, to be there and, um, and, uh, we, I, I had already been in Europe for a few, for a week, I think visiting a friend and, um, so I was already acclimated to the time. So I would get up sort of at, at, in the morning generally, whereas Yancey kind of flew in and flew out. So he never, I don't think you ever got over your jet lag. He just would like, well, I'm going to sleep till four because that's when I have to go to the, what, what did they call it? The glam? The glam suite to the get glam suite to get all glam my hair up. done and makeup and all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so Yancey had his staff there helping him. And so I'm like, so I'm like on my own and just kind of doing my own thing. And so I went down for, for coffee and I'm sitting there and at, at the, uh, at the little coffee place at the hotel and this couple, they weren't a couple, but two people next to me. Um, well, I don't know, maybe they were a couple, right? <laughs> I don't know. But it was a, it was a man and a woman. And they were speaking a f- foreign language, and I don't didn't know the foreign language. Um, it was the man was black, and the woman uh, was of color. I don't not didn't seem to be black, but but everybody in the whole hotel in the entire hotel um, had something to do with film. Like it was you know obvious anybody that could even get you had to like show your ID and stuff to even get into that hotel. So. Everybody there was had to do with film. And so 
I'm just there having my morning coffee and um, they're talking and I hear, and, and we had just seen the movie. It premiered the night before. So it was a buzz and it was so exciting. It's hard to even explain how exciting it was. And, and we hear them talking or I hear them talking and I hear one of the, one of them say, um, Osage. And it just kind of made me excited, you know, cause like, here we are at Can- in Cannes and somebody's talking about Osage. It doesn't, it's like, like mind blowing to us, you know, or to me. And I, you know, kind of like, and I look at them and I said, Oh, I'm Osage. And they both swung around and looked at me <laughs> and they're like, oh, you are. And then they were just so like emotional, right? Just like, like wanting to, and, and, and so, and I, I mean, I understood in, in a way, you know, like, oh, they're really concerned about our story. They're blah, blah, blah. But that wasn't it. That wasn't it. Um, I remember the man stopping. And what's interesting about this story is that he later stopped Yancey in the hall too. But it's really cool because he says, he looks at me and he says, that story, this is amazing for film. This is amazing for storytelling because you're telling our story too Mm. of colonialism. Mm. And big money is going to that. And that was what was important to those filmmakers, right? In that little, you know, in, in, the, in the morning there, that was the vibe, was that from all around the world, these tiny little indie film people that are trying to catch a break, trying to tell their like passionate, glorious stories that are important no money's going to it necessarily like you know what i mean it's like shoestring yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. and they're just like their minds are blown because big money went to this story of a people Hmm. yeah he he so he told me he he stopped me in the hallway he got real emotional uh like teary-eyed and he was just going you know i i watched i watched he saw the premiere and he goes, I, I, he goes, thank you for being in it. And thank you for being a part of this. Cause you're, it's not just your story. It's, it's my, it's my people's story and it's being told everywhere and the colonialism and, and how it affected us, me. And I mean, that was all the people that from different countries that have been under colonialism recognized it recognized it as their own story so i mean it, that was uh it was pretty emotional hearing him talk about it and how much it it affected him now you're make, making me want to see how it's playing or the impact on in other countries as a film is going around the globe and seeing how people react to it it's made more money overseas than it in the united states oh wow interesting that. Very yeah. interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. I'm pretty sure about that. Yeah. Well, Maura and Yancey, we're recording this conversation during awards season, which I'm sure you're both aware. Uh, Killers of the Flower Moon is nominated for Directors Guild of America, Screen Actors Guild of America, and Oscar Awards. What are your hopes and plans for the events, Maura? Are you saving your money? <laughs> I mean, you just said. <laughs> <laughs> well, I. And how will the how will people know the Osage are in the house? Oh Maura, my that's gosh. your job. <laughs> well, yeah, not, actually, I had knee surgery two weeks ago, so I can't. I'm pretty immobile right now. Just actually, this is my first venture into my studio from my house today, right now. Like, I, like. 15 minutes before we got on, I moved over. So I don't, but so it has been incredibly exciting. Um, you know, I, I got to go to a couple of premieres. Um, but, uh, I think this, you know, <laughs> I don't know yet. I, 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 ha- I have, I will say, uh, gotten to see a lot of my work, my, my, uh, uh, beadwork. Yancey's been wearing my, my clothes. Uh, not, I didn't, des- I didn't design the, the structure of the clothes, but I, um, but I, but I've, you know, he's, I've, I've 
done a lot of the I, the blanket that he wears. My mom and I made actually the one that I wear on the red carpet, and then she's beaded two blazers for me, and I've worn both of them at different different uh, events and and uh, when I've gone been on the red carpet and stuff, and so I've got compliments on the beadwork and and the design and stuff. So everybody's you, you're not on you're not on Facebook, but the the one pictures that I had with Daniel Day Lewis. I'm wearing the white jacket and with Ethan Hawke and all of that and uh, and other Laura Lenny, but everybody always comments, man, that jacket is awesome. Oh, the that's white awesome to one. hear. There, there's a lot of people that make comments about it. Oh, that's so awesome to hear. That was a that was a tedious job. <laughs> Made from love. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you will be represented. Yes. <laughs> you will be you yes. will be in the house. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And also tell us your hopes and plans for your father's book, A Pipe for February. We mentioned that it's being you're working on adaptations, an audio version of it. How's that going and what do you hope the impact will be? Well, I know that we're working on it. My my son Miles Redcorn, who's twenty four years old and is a is a writer like my dad. He uh, he wrote a script uh, for a TV series for my dad's book for about like you know eight episodes miniseries, and it's been uh, it's been uh, people in the in the know and in the power uh, really like it, and it it looks like we'll be moving forward on it in 2024 uh, as soon as we figure out exactly what where we're going and what what we're doing, but it's. Uh, we 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 feel pretty confident it'll be a, it'll be into a TV series and it'll be great because we'll be able to if it's eight episodes or whatever it is we really can get into the characters and and everything you know about it and it it'll look different it, it won't be looking like a western like Killers of the Man it'll be different and it seems like I mean I think that's a, a lot of comments that I'm getting um is you know you get the the question of why isn't this directed by you know a native or an osage it's like and uh, the obvious answer to me is like well who's going to give anybody that much money to do anything right <laughs> and so there's there's that that part of it um but also you know how i think yancy p- makes a great point of having the the ability and his son miles talks about this too is having kind of the luxury of the storytelling that is within a miniseries situation, as opposed to trying, you know, we, we got super lucky and got invited to, uh, to go to visit, uh, uh, Martin Scorsese's office in New York city. So we, we went there and, it was really exciting. It was, it was, it was kind of awesome. It was kind of the first time we were out, in with this whole process and i remember going in there and and everybody in the office would see yancy and they'd be like because they'd seen the movie because they were editing it so we we met the editor uh thelma and uh, what's yancy can you thelma schoonhaver who's up for uh, an academy award or an oscar for at Be- best editing yeah so we go so we get up to the office and we're like walking in and stuff and and I was, you know, I was like pretty giddy and excited. And, and every, all the editors were like, oh, it's Yancey. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, do I have to be Yancey's little sister again? <laughs> <laughs> yes. My whole life trying to get from out from under that. So here I am, Yancey's little sister. And we get to, Thel- uh, yeah, that was Thelma's office where we go in and she goes, oh, I want to show you this scene. Or I don't know if it was a. Oh, she just want. She was excited too. So, so she goes. I want to show you this, and she, she walks us over, and she goes, "Yancy, you can sit in Marty's chair." <laughs> <laughs> it was so wow. awesome. But it. But um, all that to say, um, that it was a that that editing was really. She had this whole wall in her office. Um, with all of the scenes that were shot. And it was, I think, what they were probably about 
you know, two inches by six inches, right? Yancey, does that, does that, yeah. does that ring true? And they were just lined up and it was packed and it was her job. It's her job to edit, right? To curate all of those scenes. I mean, they were here for so long, so many scenes, so many, so much stuff. Well, got she taken said, out. she said, uh, she said it was the most film filming that Marty's ever done for a movie. And she, and she said he's done a lot in other movies. And she said, this is the most she's ever done. And so she had to go through all of that stuff. Well, apparently she lives and breathes it. Well, and it was, I mean, I mean, to the, 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 to the idea, the concept of like, you know, that a lot of the nuances that hopefully we can get to in a series right now, you know, you, you, you do a series you you immediately get taken out of the any of the movie awards, but that's not exactly. I mean, I don't know. Maybe maybe somebody else on our team or whatever is interested in that. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in to, in the art in the aspect of let's tell this story. Maybe like you guys, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is your. This is this is what you do. You talk about history. You talk. You you know dream about what's next or what is the next thing. Um. And so even though, you know, the accolades and the Academy, you know, the Academy Awards or, or the very, or the Golden Globes or whatever those are, you know, all, well, Golden Globes encompasses, does that encompass TV too? I don't remember. Yeah. I'm sorry, I yeah, don't yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. Golden yes, Globes does. does. Yeah. But, right. Again, to my point is like, that's not important to me personally. That's not where it's at. Where it's at is, Let's tell a story. Let's tell this story. Let's let's do dad some justice here. Right? Yes. In all in the years of work he put into this and in the hours and hours he spent, you know, working on it and get those nuances. There's this one scene in the movie where you see the and they use this. I don't think they even asked permission. I don't know how the negotiation went, but whatever. Um, you see the guy begging uh, somebody who doesn't speak English, uh, the salesman to buy the car. Remember that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Some of the, so a criticism that I have heard from that, and I, this isn't, I, because I, I throw in dad's book when I see that. So I say to see, I insert what, what John said in that, right. Where, so the guy's begging, the salesman is begging him to buy a car. And John's like, I've got, a car and john in the book in the book john in the book thank you uh john gray eagle is thinking i've already got a car and in fact i just inherited my grandfather's pierce arrow and he's thinking this right because you get that nuance as you're reading a book and the guy's sitting there begging and, and he's just like this was just embarrassing right it was an embarrassing moment to him i don't know if you necessarily get that in the you know because you because does it look i don't know because i can't watch it without inserting my own thoughts but does it look like this person who doesn't speak english or this person who's you know um maybe uh not uh able to negotiate for themselves or whatever are they getting duped Right. Mm -hmm. Are they looking like the victim in that? But in the movie, you know, a lot of stuff is cut and I wasn't in that scene. I don't have any idea. You know, maybe they tried to elaborate on that negotiation or that negotiation more. Does that make sense? Is this the one where you see, um, I think it's the day that people are getting their, um, their uh, head rights checks. Yeah, they're going through multiple scenes there. Right. So my sense was the guy who was in the car was kind of like, mm, okay, just 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 buy the ca- car because this guy is just you know okay. he's, he's That's making good to know. this. Yeah, it was yeah. like an act of charity. Yeah, it was like yes. he's talking about his family and he needs the money and this that and the other. Okay, okay, let's just buy the car. You know, <laughs> glad to hear that because because. I didn't 
how that read because again I was inserting a lot. Yeah. You know, I I can't obviously can't watch this without bringing a lot. To- well, there there is a doubleness to it. Yeah, though. it is. You yeah. do believe that that guy might be giving them a story and that he's trying to take advantage, but you don't get the sense that they are just being taken advantage of. They're kind of like, "Okay, let's just get this guy out of our face. He's he obviously needs to sell this car. We'll just buy it. We can afford it. We'll just buy it. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So it's not like the power feels unequal in that scene. You know, it reminded me of stories some people told me of the Great Depression, where there were black farmers who were in areas where there were poor white people and that they would share food with them from their farms. So for some reason, that came to mind when oh, I saw that cool. scene. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. And I love that. that. Makes sense. Yeah, I love that. That's cool. But other people might see something different. That's the power of film. Yeah. Yes, it yeah. is. Yes, <laughs> right. it is. Yeah. But we are thrilled about the idea of a series because we love dramatic series because you can get those layers and that texture and all the color. And the, you can really stretch out in terms of presenting a culture when you have a, a limited series. So, and, and the, the characters and the, yeah. Yes. Well, we will do a program about that for sure. So <laughs> keep, keep us posted. Keep us hey, we, we definitely will. Yeah. So we've come to that part in our podcast where we ask our guests questions that are related to the themes of the podcast. And you've given us a lot in terms of the, uh, you know, window on the past around the Osage and the context in which these uh, crimes were happening and the culture of the people. So we're going to ask you about our time capsule question, because we too are in history and, you know, through our own lives. So if you had three items that you would put in a time capsule that reflect your life and time, so the times you've lived through, what would those three items be? Who goes first? Go, Yancey. Uh, uh, The first thing that comes to mind is I would put what is called the slide that you put around your kerchief. And actually, I used that slide uh, in the movie. In the, some of the scenes, you can see it. And it's got a peyote moon on it and stuff. And uh, I think my dad gave it to me in the 70s. Mm. And, uh, and, it, and, and it reminds me of when I was a kid dancing uh, at our tribal Osage dances called the Alanchka. And uh, it always reminds me of that earlier time. My dad was the whip man. Which was he was he was kind of the uh, the person that was in in charge of keeping order in the dances and stuff, and uh, so that that's one item that I that I would I would do because that reminds me of 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 that time of when I was little and and dancing and uh, and there was not that many big dancers then, and uh, I remember enjoying that a lot. You want to go for your ears more, and then I'll. Think oh, of my two others. Ah, man. This is such a complicated question for me. And I'll tell you why. Because, um, kind of Marie Kondo stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, stuff is a different, has a different emotion and feeling for me. There's a few things that are very precious to me. Um, that remind me of time, you know, when I, when I first went through this, I thought, Oh, my, uh, my rugby Jersey. Right. Cause that defines oh, sure. something of mm-hmm. what, who I am, but I gave it away as one does, because, you know, I think that's another thing that's kind of interesting about thinking about a time capsule, like, like that puts me part of me forward. And I'm always like, Eh. <laughs> you know what's my legacy i don't know i'm gonna be gone i don't know i don't know and you know it's funny too because i one of the things that i did when i was i just got out of college i think and i came home and i had learned how to do woodworking and just kind of you know dabbled in that i'm getting more into it now but um 
I came home and I was like, oh, and I, and I had, I don't know if I read about this. Maybe you guys would know more about this because you're more historians than we are. But um, I read about a culture that you would build your coffin and then use ah. it while you were alive. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. There's some there's cultures yeah. al- around the world where you do that. And I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> and so I came home and I was so excited. I thought, you know, I thought mom and dad would be thrilled. They were not. <laughs> <laughs> no, parents. Are no, not. they no, were not. No. Dad was like, no, please don't do that. So in honor of my dad, I have not done that, even though I do like would love to. Um, but you know, it's kind of funny too, because in some ways I'm sort of preparing for my funeral and I've been sort of preparing it for it for my whole life. One of the things we do in the Osage as fu- in, for funerals is you kind of give your, give your stuff away. Um, as you know, of course you do, you're not going to be here, you know, <laughs> but right, you give yeah. it to the people who have helped you. So for instance, you give during, I mean, you give it to people who have helped with the funeral specifically. So I have a pretty substantial hoard of blankets that have been given to me over the years because blankets are a big deal in our culture where we give and receive blankets. Uh, if somebody helps, like, you know, you help dress somebody's kid and they give you a blanket. Yancey, when he names, he's always given blankets, even doesn't matter what time of year. And he'll be standing there with that blanket over him, sweating. <laughs> <laughs> trying to do the stuff. Um, and then, so I, you know, I've been keeping those and even, and just like, Oh, I'm going to be ready for my funeral. Even though during a funeral, the family members or people in the community will bring blankets for you to give. So it's not imperative that you do that. And dishes are another thing that, um, are really important. And, and, and the dishes that were in, um, some of the scenes they, they pulled old dishes from different places were actually our, um, uh, great uncle, uh, Raymond Redcorn, uh, he and his wife, Waltina, they were, um, that, that was their dishes. Those were the dishes that mm-hmm. were actually used in the film because we still use them every year too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you give dishes to the cooks um, when they help you at your funeral. So I have a hoard of dishes as well that, you know, I can't put in a time capsule because I need them. Right. Right. You may have to change this question. Yeah, we may have a way at your, because I think about things like that too. Like what would be given to people once I've passed on? Yeah. Yeah. I just gave some dishes to our nephew and his wife that belonged to our aunt, our aunt who knew Duke Ellington. (gasps) Oh, wow. So I still have some of them, but it was such a large set. I said, we need to keep it in the family. Yes. Wow. Well, wow. let them know who Miles is named after. You could probably guess. Uh, yeah. Miles Davis. Oh. My son's name is named after Miles Davis. So I, I sense a jazz lover here. Yeah. <laughs> well, we kind of derailed artistic family. And we do, <laughs> totally derailed that question. So if I get, if I'm, if I'm pressed to answer, well, I would say some dishes, a blanket, and maybe my rugby jersey, you know? <laughs> <laughs> if you'd kept if it. I kept yeah. them. I don't know. Yeah. Well, that works. That works. Well, thank you, Maura and Yancey, for joining us on Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters to talk about this very important history, your family. And of course, um, this history is something that people, many people are learning for the first time. And to Queen and I wish you all the success. We're looking forward to the adaptation of your father's novel, A Pipe for February. Which I will be reading once Michonne gives it over to me. (laughs) (laughs) And all the best to you and the Killers of the Flower Moon cast and production for the award ceremonies coming up. Thank you. I have a, did, Yancey didn't finish his capsule. Did you think of something else, Yancey? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. I derailed the whole thing. Sorry. (laughs) 
Well, I can always put in that nice beaded jacket you're getting so many compliments on. Yeah, we'll add the beaded jacket. (laughs) Right, right. There we go. And a copy of your dad's book. Oh, now there's a great way, like, duh. (laughs) And I saw your mom's pottery, which is gorgeous. It's exquisite. (laughs) It really is. Yancey, tell them where her pottery was. It was in the... uh office of uh, the Oval Office during uh, uh, President Obama and, and Michelle Obama. They picked her pottery and it was in the Oval Office the whole time he was in office until he uh, you know, left after he served his eight years. So yeah. it stayed in the same place the whole time and you could see pictures of it in the background of, of President Obama shaking hands of dignitaries and you know entertainers and all that kind of stuff. So she's uh, she, it was pretty cool. She's she's a she's a big deal. She's a, a legend. For our listeners, nominated for ten Academy Awards, Killers of the Flower Moon is currently streaming on Apple TV with a subscription and available for downloads and streaming for a fee. The books, A Pipe for February by Charles H. Redcorn and Killers of the Flower Moon by David Grant, are available in our affiliate bookstore. Go to our website, click on the link, and purchase your copies. Your purchases support this podcast and independent booksellers in your community. And I'll make a note. We'll add a link to your mother's pottery so that people can see it on our webpage. Absolutely. We invite you to share this episode of Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters with someone you know who would enjoy the conversation. Subscribe to Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters and enjoy past episodes wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. Sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date on future episodes and bonus content. You can write us at podcast at michonbostongroup.com. Like and share Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters on your social media. This is Michonne Boston. And this is Tequina Boston. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters, a podcast about historical films and series dramas. Visit our webpage at michonbostongroup.com backslash Boston Sisters. Tell us what historical dramas you're watching. Who knows? We may do a show about it. Sign up for our newsletter, subscribe to the podcast, and share it with the people you know who binge on historical drama. Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters is brought to you by the Michonne Boston Group. The views and opinions expressed on historical drama with the Boston Sisters are those of the speakers and do not represent the positions or views of the Michonne Boston Group, its clients or affiliates. This is Michonne Boston. And this is Tequina Boston. Thank you for listening.